All right, thanks, Kimberly. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning from California, West Coast US, and hi to wherever you are around the world to join in this session today. Um, my name's Phil Sol, and I'll do a brief intro in a second, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, this session is about creating your next generation future finance function as part of the 24th uh, North American Shared Services Week. So what are we gonna talk about today in this workshop? So the purpose is that given, you know, we're all living in a really fast paced tech dig digital, uncertain, interconnected, rapidly changing world, especially with what's going on in the world right now with uh, the pandemic and, and social change and circumstances and environmental issues. So with all of that said, the importance of finance as a service and finance as a function, finance as part of one office is all becoming really, really critical for the finance function as, as it was traditionally. The next generation finance function has to transform. And we use this word, we've been using this word loosely some, for, for, for decades, but really we are in this fast paced, accelerating transformational world. And finance has to adapt to that and be, become that true business partner that we've been talking about for a long time, really has to speed, provide speed, quality, flexibility, be scalable and efficient. But it also, and this is still important, needs to deliver on the more traditional bookkeeping, debit and credit accounting, compliance and control responsibilities, because finance wears a number of hats, and we'll talk a little bit about, about that in a second. So how do we transform the finance function? That's really what we're going to be touching on and talking about today. How do we drive continuous improvement? How do we link to and leverage the digital world and digitization efforts and leverage all the tools at your disposal as you try to establish your finance function as a true valued business partner offering true value on, uh, in the metric, which we'll be talking about, the, the equation, benefit over a cost. And so in this session, we'll be talking about a number of topics, including back office to one office, which some of you may have heard about, some of the uh, role of predictive analytics and latest technologies. And then towards the end, we'll be talking about the finance team itself. So that's the purpose of the workshop today. And that's what we're planning to talk to and take any questions Linking back to Kimberly, if you have questions as we move through, this is a workshop, so please go ahead and ask them. Okay. So I uh, will first of all start with the introduction in a second. Then I'll be talking about the, uh, sorry, Chaz, can you just head back one second? Then we'll be talking about the role of finance itself specifically. Then I'll be talking about some of the trends we're seeing and some of those accelerations that I talked about. Then we'll focus a little bit about digital and digitalization and the latest technologies. And then Chaz will take over to, at the end and talk a lot, a lot more about the finance team, the role of finance operating models, et cetera. So that's the purpose, of, that's the agenda for today. Okay, so uh, my name's Phil Searle. I'm the founder and CEO of Chasey Partners. I'll be your lead host today, supported by Chaz Moore, who introduced himself in a second. Um, I've been a finance professional for a, lot, a long time, 30 years. I originally qualified actually with KPMG um, back in the UK where I came from, qualified as an auditor and then had a number of what I call more traditional finance roles, <clears throat> including a uh, controller of the uh, of Freecom Corporation um, based here in California so when I originally moved here, <clears throat> which uh, I led it there. I, as part of that, I led a number of initiatives around organization, technology, service delivery, shared services and business transformation, acquisitions, divestitures, etc. cetera, from Freecom. For those of you who remember Freecom and Palm, which is part of part of 3Com at the time. Then I was a business unit CFO with a part of the Ascendant Group in the international business, which is now called Travelport. And then I founded Chasey Partners and we've grown the business uh, significant, significantly since then. And one of our key pillars is finance. Chaz, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Phil. So my name is Chaz Moore. I'm a senior project manager with Chasey. Uh, yeah, uh, prior to Chasey, I was uh, spent most of my career in the healthcare sector up in Canada. And that's actually where I met Chasey about eight years. I came to a conference looking for the leading practices. We knew what we knew, but we really wanted to bring an independent uh, voice in. We were bringing another entity onto our ERP and back end, and we wanted someone to bring in best practices and make sure it just wasn't a takeover one entity to the other and someone to do that benchmarking and make sure we were really adopting the best practices forward. That was a great experience. I ended up joining Chasey a little bit uh, after that. I'm a chartered accountant, CPA, and uh, looking forward to uh, presenting today. So thank you, Phil. Thanks, Chas. Okay. 
a little bit more about just briefly on a couple of slides on who we are. So Chasey Partners, I mentioned, founded in 20, 2006, we're headquartered in California, but we have teams and, and legal entities across the globe. We operate in the Americas, the MIA and Asia PAC. Um, we basically do soup to nuts, end to end assessment, strategic advice, project management, implementation support, and provide subject matter expertise. The, fin the functions we cover include the, the big four of finance, HR, IT, procurement, but we do member services, customer support facilities. It's really focused on what you might traditionally call back office, although we're actually going to challenge that concept a little bit today. Um, when, as you've probably heard from both myself and Chaz, we're pr practitioners first. Uh, not consultants by birth, but we've been we've we've changed to being consultants and and driving transformation with our with our client partnerships. We have three service delivery offerings: what I call the more traditional shared services, multifunctional, single functional, global business services, end to end, robotic process automation. We have an RPA capability and broader intelligent automation. We've been working in for the last five years, and then broader business transformation, which can include. End-to-end uh, -end transformation of operating models, things like mergers and acquisition support, business continuity plan, technology enablement, SI work, that sort of thing. So those are our three pillars. On the next slide, we show a few of our clients. I'll just, I won't go through them, but on the left-hand side, we've got our higher education public sector. We've done a lot of work, for example, with the University of California system. Um, in the middle, we've got a, a sort of a larger, a mid to large side uh, companies and many multinationals you, you'll see the names of. We've done a lot of work with Coca-Cola bottlers across the globe, for example. We've done a lot of work with First Data and SAS, uh, uh, Varian, Gilead. Some, some of these, I'm sure you recognize some of these company names on here. And on the right-hand side is more of our Latin American-based um, clients. We have a lot of business in Latin America, including the likes of Aeromexico, um, Semex, Godal, Dos Pinos, Alicorp, Tenaris, and others. So that's just a broad spectrum of some of our clients over the last 15 years. Okay, so now to get to the, uh, the presentation, the workshop session today. So first of all, what, is, what exactly is the role of finance? And sometimes we sort of don't think about that very much. So if we go to the next slide, Chaz, the role of finance, I've used this sort of lens as the way of looking at finance. So whenever we, I, we assess the finance function, we think we look at it through this lens. This lens is adapting with a new move to one office and digitalization, but it's still absolutely relevant. You've got your back bottom left, which we call again, the more traditional back office services, which includes general accounting, accounts payable, accounts receivable, fixed assets, et cetera. In, in an end-to-end -end perspective is record to report, order to cash, procure to pay, hire to retire, for example, payroll and T&E, et cetera, for this, to the extent they're within finance. Professional and technical covers things like a little bit further up the value chain, like planning, planning and analysis a little bit which I'll come back to again, cash management, legal statutory tax compliance credit. On the right hand side is your traditional controllership functions, which include obviously control of the, the enterprise wide um, compliance and control and reporting, which has a number of areas you can see in here, closed calendars, working capital management, internal controls, regulatory compliance, business reviews, et cetera. So you'll see at the bottom there, you have this sort of compliance control element to that. On the left, you have the process element linked to more the back office services. And top left, you have the more business partnering decision support elements, which, is, which we're calling for the sake of it here, commercial. Some of that can be more centralized, for example, a BI team or an FPNR team, financial planning reporting team some standard manager reporting, and some is distributed, so it sits closer to the end customer, which can be decision support or business partnering, analysis, contract negotiation, profitability analysis, some budgeting, et cetera. And in the top right, you have the more strategic enterprise-wide initiatives, which includes things like M&A, divestitures, uh, enterprise-wide planning reporting, financing for the business, risk management, treasury services, that sort of thing. So you'll see at the top, you have this business partnering emphasis and on the right, you have the strategy emphasis. So they're all, they're not independent boxes. There are overlaps, but there are different ways of looking at the role of finance. And when you're assessing your finance function, especially the function of the future, you need to understand the skill sets required, the balance required between these, the investment to be made in these, the degree you can automate these, the training attached to each, people development amongst each, et cetera. And we'll come back to that a little bit later in Chaz's section. But I always found this useful and we tend to sort of use this as sort of a pointer of the role of finance. Okay, thank you. Add to this, uh, yep. 
we're, we're going to come back to this and talk about an operating model, and you'll you'll see these boxes uh, rearrange and what they roll. One of the important parts is to understand what people are actually doing versus their job description. And, and what we find in some of our clients that have more of a traditional model, there's a lot of controllers in the organization, but they're really more in this bottom left quadrant. They're not in this bottom right, but you're paying for bottom right, but you're not getting that service. And you might find that in some of your organization. And so really defining a role, building a one office, and we'll talk about some of those strategies can really uh, help make, understand what's happening in practice and help do it by design. It's actually interesting when you mentioned that, Chaz, because controller is a, def is a word that's defined very differently across different companies and organizations, from my experience. Sometimes it's the more traditional back office role of controller, and sometimes a controller is, is actually seen as a business unit support. So I've seen controllers defined differently, but for the sake of here, it's more the sort of uh, enterprise-wide control aspect we're looking at here. Okay. So just drilling, drilling, drilling down on this business partnering decision support area. To me, this is very important as you think of your finance function, especially around value, especially around partnering, especially around guiding the decision and being closer to the front office of finance as opposed to the more traditional process, debit and credit, uh, uh, transactional administrative elements of finance. What the, 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 the negative I've seen here a lot over the years is you sometimes, quite frankly, hire up finance people to do, to do decision support, but they're actually not doing it at all. They're actually doing basic day-to-day -day accounting and control. So that's important. You, you don't want to be paying and, tr and hiring people to do a role, one, that they're, they're probably not suited to or even want to do, and two, actually isn't the role you hired them to do in the first place. So I've used this sort of, what exactly does decision support business partnering mean? Well, I've just sort of thrown something on here. The Oxford English Dictionary calls it as a conclusion or resolution reached off consideration the, the action or process of deciding and support is the giving assistance, encouragement or approval to confirm or back up a decision. So decision support from a finance perspective is providing that support to the, to the business, to your client, internal client to support making better decisions. That's what that means. But you don't have to, on the right hand side, you have to have a, there's a cost associated with that. And it's quite frankly, there's no laws or legal requirements or tax that says you have to have a finance business partnering decision support function. So to invest in finance decision support, to invest in leadership, which you need to do, you need to make sure that you have the right roles and responsibilities, the right skill sets, the right training, the right focus. And again, we'll come back to that a little bit later. Finally, on the left hand side of this slide, I often hear the terms FPNR and FPNA, financial planning and reporting, financial planning and analysis. I actually prefer to call it FPRNA, financial planning, reporting and analysis, because the reporting tends to be a little bit more standardized, centralized, and can be put in a center of expertise, for example. And we talk about central financial planning reporting here, whereas analysis tends to be a uh, more point in time closer to the business decision based at the coal face, if you'd like to put it that way. So financial planning and analysis tends to be more decision support focused. Financial planning reporting tends to be more providing a structure and guidance and uh, some support, but can be more centralized versus decentralized, which is the A part. Anyway, we thought we'd put this up here because it's, it's a critical part of finance as you move to next gen, where if you're really gonna become a true business partner, you really need to make sure you have the right description of the role, the right understanding of the role, understand um, the, the, the skill sets required, pay people to do the right role and enable them to having supporting functions within finance to provide the reporting, the data and the debits and credits and the close, et cetera. Yeah, and I'll just add, it's interesting when we're working uh, with clients and we ask them, so what do you think of your business partner? And you know, often people say, I really love my business partner, but then you have to ask them, well, what do they do? And you find that they're the one basically keeping the organization moving, chasing invoices and, and doing, a, they're involved in a lot of transactional. They help people hire whatever the uh, need is, but they're not actually, when you ask them, well, so how are they influencing decisions? Are they at your leadership table? Are they helping to be proactive? And then that role isn't done, but don't take them away because I need them for the transaction. So one of the key parts, we'll come back to this, is getting the basics right. Because if you're not getting the basics right, those senior people, they are needed to keep the engine moving. 
But once you can standardize, get those basics right, you can actually free up that capacity to get that. So this is a really good flag on the health and how mature your organization is. It, do you actually have the capacity and effectiveness for a mature decision support function? Or are those resources keeping transactions moving? So that's an Absolutely. interesting analysis when you start doing this. A, a quick story, one of my past uh, role line roles. I, I I was a CFO, a business unit CFO, and I and I went to one of the countries and uh, I met the the finance director in that country, who was one of my direct reports. And I said, "How do you see your role of, in finance?" And he said, "I'm a business partner. I'm here to support the business. I'm here to give guidance and leadership to to drive the business forward." Uh, the this, the CEO of that legal entity was in the office right next door to the to him, um, and after I'd spoken to him, I went to the office next door and I said. I won't say any names, but he said that uh, he's your business partner and he works and supports you and he's your right hand man. And, and the answer I got from the CEO, CEO was, I never see him. So there was a complete disconnect between the leader, the finance director's perception of the role he performed and his leading business partner role of what he did. And actually that linked to the fact he really spent most of his time doing basic day to day uh, transactional. So we, we work together on, on changing that. Okay. So what are the some of those global trends in the future finance function of the future of finance? So Chaz, next slide. So there's a, there's a, there's a few uh, uh, pointers on here and we'll talk about it. So finance, the operating model is, and with digitalization is having to adapt. I mentioned that already. So finances itself is expanding its scope and responsibility and finance is part of this one office trend that we're gonna come back to. One office is basically, I touched on it earlier, and, and there are, we're going to come back to this again. It's, not, it's less about the back office, middle office, and front office in the new enterprise of the future. It's more about one office, which is integrated to support the requirements of your external customer. And in providing the support, the, the requirements of the external customer, you have to provide the, 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 the requirements of your internal customer. And we'll come back to that, and, and Chaz will talk about that. But finance is becoming more front office, one office orientated than back office. And not to say the back office roles to Chaz's point aren't still critical, they are, but you don't want them to take up too much time, effort, energy, cost, and you want them to be seamless and efficient and effective as much as possible. It, obviously with the, with, the, with the growth and change and digitalization and the fast moving economy, you need to be innovative, agile and productive. And that's absolutely true of finance. It can't be a traditional old school debit and credit organization. Also, finance has become an arbiter and capture a lot of data and can use that data to help drive business partnering, including that insight and knowledge we talked about. Third point here, there's a lot of new tools out there around intelligent automation we're gonna come back to, including our robotic process automation, machine learning and AI, artificial intelligence. Again, we'll come back to that. Business process outsourcing has been fundamentally disrupted by the trends, not just from the recent, but over the last few years really the old lift and shift and be that business process outsourcing and to some degree offshore or, or offshoring internally, but the old lift and shift, move it over overseas, out of sight, out of mind, is an important seamless, um, uh, you know, move it away from the business is actually reversed. And that because of the need to have data and processes closely more closely aligned to the front office, this Business process outsourcing has definitely had to adapt from being just a, a sort of engine room for transactional, has to become more problem solving and analytical and more um, technology driven. And with ro RPA and robotic arbitrage, which we'll come back to later, there's actually less, potentially less benefit from uh, the lift and shift BPO outsourcing to generate labor arbitrage savings as well. Yeah, uh, so out of that, we were talking about this uh, yesterday as we were preparing for this session. It is interesting that those global supply chains, you know, depending, they're much more uh, sensitive to government and politics. Uh, over the last few months, we've seen that with the reaction to the pandemic. And so that is one of those drivers, and you'll see that as one of the number seven trend. And, and also, you know, when an organization, if you're going to look at outsourcing, um, a best practice is to understand your business, get the efficiencies you can from it, and then look at, okay, how do we get more savings out of this? Is this maybe outsourcing? Is this maybe going to setting up in a new lower cost location? The power of the robotic arbitrage is that you can achieve that without that pain of setting up a separate legal entity, without working in a different country or expanding that footprint. And so that robotic arbitrage can get a lot of those benefits 
um, and more without uh, taking on some of those uh, cons that come with those strategies. And then the next, thanks, Jason. And number five, global business services, shared services, COEs, are they still relevant? Absolutely. Do they have to evolve? Absolutely. So the traditional, again, out of sight, out of mind approach to business services or shared services is having to adapt, leverage more digital. They're becoming more centers of expertise than necessarily just a transaction engine. But GB, global business services with some of the things about supply chain, also redundancy. You can't put all your eggs in one basket. Again, that links to BPO and, and, and internal shared services. So GBS, Global Business Services, has actually become, has proved itself for the, the recent times, but it also has to evolve. It can't be old school, traditional lift and shift, transactional administrative for all the reasons we've just said. Um, the hybrid workforce that uh, Chaz has just mentioned is very important, but this is dri driven, and, and Chaz is gonna talk a lot about this later, the whole finance function itself needs to change the way it thinks about itself, its skills, its training, its recruiting, its hiring practices, its um, people development practices all need to change because in this new world of hybrid workforces, um, you know, uh, fast moving decision making, pandemics, global, su global supply chain disruption, everything we've talked about, the, the finance function needs to change the way it hires, recruits, develops and, and retains its, its staff. And then finally, of course, the global pandemic has driven a move to a lot of remote work working, reduced travel. It's also driven global recessions. And we've touched on this, a desire to bring supply chains closer to home. A again, you have to be able to adapt and be flexible to that. And I think the testament to many finance organizations around the world, including GBS ones, they've been able to do that. But it is absolutely one of the trends you're going to have to do. We're not going to go back to the old way of doing things. How far we go back once... Uh, hopefully we, we have a vaccine and things start to settle down a little bit, then maybe things will go back a bit, but they're never gonna be the same again. And that's part of the whole future finance function. So on the left-hand side, just in summary, there's a trend to one office with a real client on a focus on the client, both external and internal, and more integration, both within finance and with other functions. There's a hybrid workforce of people and technology. There's a use of data and knowledge-based services. And there's this element of bringing things closer to home from a supply chain, remote working and business, business support perspective. So I'll, I'll pause there in case Chaz, you got any other comments before we move on or any- I questions? thought maybe we could open it up if there's any questions from the group. Uh, this is probably our first big content slide. And so we want to uh, make sure we had some time here to digest it. So any questions from the group? If you do, please unmute and please ask verbally. I believe the chat is not active. So if questions need to be offered verbally. I have a question on GBS. If GBS is having to evolve, what is the new KPIs for them to move the needle and show their value to their organizations? Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of evolving, I sort of touched on it a bit and I'll be very happy to take this offline a little bit. So I wrote, I wrote a short article on, on global business services because it was, I was asked, are they, are they more relevant or less relevant? And my answer was they're, they're, they're more relevant if they evolve. And the evolving is around the digitalization, the bringing... The, the integration, the, uh, less of the out of sight, out of mind, uh, redundancy, you, you know, ex for example, with the pandemic, but not just pandemic, it could be any business disruption, you can't be relying on a one or two centers. And really, it's around adopting best new technologies and new end to end processes, building off what you've got, but, but actually bringing stuff back close to the business. Whereas if you think of the more traditional sort of shared services models, they were, again, a little bit out of sight, out of mind. So you're having to retrain and reskill some of them. But having said all of that, the principles of GBS and the, the, the going up the value chain, end-to-end -end business process ownership, uh, leveraging technology, providing quality service to the client are all very consistent with, with uh, the future finance function as well. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, Phil, one of the things that you want to see with your performance metrics, they should be evolving. Oh, yeah. So oh, as yeah. your business evolves, your metrics should be evolving. And if your metrics are looking at uh, the very transactional error rates and such, if, if those you would hope once the GBS gets mature, is those aren't interesting anymore because right. they're done. And so you should be, they're still being recorded and they're still being tracked and you can help with root cause analysis, but they're not on your dashboard because that's not where the critical attention is. And you can move on to what Phil was saying around those value added. So one thing we do with performance metrics, we sometimes get the question if, how do I make my performance metrics and my dashboards 
important to my client. They don't care. Why are we spending any time on this? Yeah. And one, you know, one of the questions is, well, have you asked the client what's important to them? And so part of your performance metric, that's part of the conversation, especially as you move up the value chain, is understanding how are we going to measure performance? What are the important metrics here? And then, yes, you're going to supplement it with key operational and other metric that you need, but start with what the client need, and then that will automatically make the report much more relevant to them. And they'll be actually more interested in some of the other metrics that you want to get in front of them too. Absolutely, Chess. Thank you. I mean, you're basically having to adapt your KPIs and metrics to, to, to map to the change in the requirements from finance, but not dismissing again the requirements for the basic, you know, keeping the engine running and the compliance as well, which GBS has done traditionally very well. Well, thank you. Great question. Um, any follow up or any other uh, comments? Hi. Yeah, this is Rich Rowan. I feel. Um, Hi, Rich. How are you? Uh, good. I, I would say just. We've been, I'm part of ZF and we've been kind of migrating more toward a global business service, but one of the key kind of challenges we have is, is the cross-functional coordination and kind of getting by some of those, I own this, you own that. So yeah. I think that all this is really good and important, but I think we're really back at that first building block, which is trying to get a consistent organization agreement to, to help us make, leverage that activity across end to end process and, and really trying to, it's kind of like the CFO role that's <clears throat> kind of breaking down those barriers. Seeing that same thing and breaking down those functional silos is really difficult. Absolutely, Rich. I mean, that's been a, I mean, you and I've known each other for a long time, right, Rich? Um, oh, yeah. break, breaking down those functional silos is, is extremely difficult and complex and, and you know, different ways of doing it and we could discuss that, but looking an end-to-end -end process view, obviously trying to look at, trying to get buy-in from across the organization across those functional silos is another part, but also uh, distinguishing the difference between business process accountability versus business process ownership versus business process delivery. They don't all necessarily have to be the same right? As you cross yeah. those lines, you can still be accountable for an outcome without actually having to deliver the actual process, just as if you, you know, use a third party contractor or an outsourcer or a, or a shared services or an internal organization or whatever. So that, that's part of it. But yeah, you're right. I mean, crossing silos has been a problem. But as you move to the one office concept, you have to cross those sides, you have to break those sides. And I think organizations are really trying to start to do that, Rich. Um, because, because they're having to uh, look at this in a more end-to-end -end way, but it's still a challenge for sure. No, yeah, I, I'd agree with you. It's it, it, even our company. I, I told my team going into this downturn because of the pandemic, it's our opportunity. But um, trying to get the company wants it, but you're still struggling with people that aren't comfortable having a global business delivering something that was functionally theirs. They're still responsible, but you know our organization would be delivering it, and that's it's just. It's very painful. Yes, yeah, a challenge. I, I understand. Yeah. It's one that has to be resolved if you're going to achieve some of the benefits here. And I'll just add to the conversation. Uh, we're going to talk more about the client yes. and to define what we mean by that. So you have your external client, your customers of your overall business. Uh, when we're talking about one of the key pieces is the internal client. And those are the people that provide the input and receive the output of your process, of your business uh, the function that's in front of you. And so, you know, if you're talking about a finance function, often the client of that are, say, finance or IT or other parts and operation. And so when you're engaging with them to trying to break down those silos, treating them as an internal client, having them be at the table when you're doing your design and making those decisions, and actually that actually helps break down the silos. It's hard to break down the silos at the end of the process. It's easier if you bring them in beginning, if possible, so they're actually a partner. And then going back to the thing, are you doing your transformation to your client or with your client? And so are you doing your transformation to your partners in the business or with them? And so um, are you trying to fix it all before you bring them in or are you bringing them in early? And that, that does, that can be a strategy to help. Yeah, so just uh, we'll, we'll move on, Chaz, but as you move on the slides, it's, it's the old question of what's in it for me? What's the benefit to me of doing this? Why would I partner with you? What's the benefit to the region? What's the benefit to the country? What's the benefit to my staff? What's the benefit to the customer? You have to answer those questions. And that's part of the partnership. 
approach that, that we just talked about. Um, Phil, this is Dahlia Rigsby, um, VP, VP for Recorder Report for Veritas. Just want to make a comment on, on what Chas said about the business partnering. Um, where we struggle is to get our place at the table when the business is starting to look at their strategy. So I think it's equally important that we include them, but they include us. So a big component of business partnering. I just wanted to add that because it goes both ways. Abs absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Yes, it's a two-way street. Abs and, I, and that's important to state. Right, right. absolutely. It's a two-way street, both in terms of partnership and engagement. Yes, you need to have a place at the table. And I hear that we're talking about finance here, but we could be talking about HR. We work with other clients who say the same thing. We're being asked to be an H, a, a strategic business partner, but we're not, we're not asked to attend the events. We're not enabled through the technology. I heard, I heard it said recently that, you know, in terms of technology, there's three requirements, compliance, front office, and there isn't a third, right? So uh, we, we, we go through all, all of these. Anyway, um, thank you thank very you. much for that. Yeah, Emily. thank you. Okay, so this is, um, that's a nice picture that I didn't design, but uh, Sarah designed. Um, the fourth industrial revolution, you know, that isn't, that isn't my phrase, but, but it is, it's real. So just for, just for the sake of a little bit of a catch up, what were the other three? The first was mortar and steam power to mechanize production. The second was electric power for mass production. The third was the digital revolution, moving from analog to, to digital, and it came with the PC, the internet, and ICT. I'm sure you guys are aware of that. So this sort of latest, trend is sometimes called the fourth industrial revolution, characterized by a fusion and development of technologies, blurring the lines, this isn't my phrase, by the way, blurring the lines between physical, physical digital, and biological. Um, but it's, how is it characterized? It's clearly robotic process automation, robotics in general, um, machine learning, artificial intelligence, blockchain, which I've seen at a number of uh, conferences and events, I've talked to blockchain, we're, we're still trying to see how that's gonna be uh, directly attributable to, to a finance function. Some finance organizations are working on blockchain as part of their, for example, distributed uh, payments or receivables processes, an example of blockchain. Other areas like nanotechnology, quantum computing, biotech, etc., cetera, um, are all part of this fourth industrial revolution. Finance needs to understand and, and, and uh, leverage these to the extent it can in a controlled way. And absolutely, that's part of the discussion at the enterprise level that the finance should be part of. Chaz, next slide. Okay, so I mentioned one office. I've, I've borrowed a, a slide from my friend Phil first at Horses for Sources here. That you can go online and, and look at the left-hand slide, but I like the comments on the right. So that's why I brought them in here. We're evolving to an era where there is only one office that matters, creating the digital customer experience linking to what Chaz was talking about and an intelligent single office to enable and support it. Now, clearly that's a strong statement. You're still going to have functions. You're still going to have office users. You're still going to have, back to Rich's point, you're still going to have silos. But to be the best, to be, where is the best to evolve and to be adapting, you need to think more as a one office. Again, back to the role of finance at the start, that doesn't mean you still don't have those lenses. You do, but they need to become more integrated and understand how they connect with each other to deliver on the ultimate enterprise-wide customer experience and benefits of the strategy. That's what that means, one office as opposed to single office. And again, just link, uh, leveraging HFS, support functions like like IT, finance, HR, and supply chain need to be aligned with supporting the customer experience as opposed to operating some sort of vacuum. That links to back to what I was saying earlier on. It's no longer about out of sight, out of mind, cheapest, lowest cost denominator. It's about being an integrated, efficient part of the engine. And again, it's about alignment of operations with the business end of the organization, not just about uh, being itself. Back to the GBS question, actually, it just makes me think about shared services. One of the things I've been sort of warning myself about and warning shared services and GBS organizations about is to almost become too self-important, too caught up in yourself as an organization, rather than forgetting they're actually, you're there for a reason. You're there to support that front office and the customer. And if you forget that, you almost become your, <clears throat> your own worst enemy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me just drink some water for a second. And, and actually that then that becomes, you almost start to, St become stale and irrelevant. So you know, always need to think about who your customer and Chaz will talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm sure we move on. All right, so this is my final section I'll be talking to and then I'll stop, we'll see if we have any more questions before we move into the final section on, on building the team. It's sort of linking to the last section as well. So going digital, so Chaz, next slide please. 
<clears throat> so this is um this isn't one of ours this is uh, we borrowed it from mckinsey but it builds it builds up off what we're talking about reshaping the future finance function on the left hand side and I, it's the second la level that's important to improve processes so it's that back office processing element to give users real-time informational information so that's leveraging data and producing reports and analysis specifically reports in the context of data visualization the third is to accelerate decision support, which we talked about earlier. What is decision support within finance? So this is providing analytics, advanced analytics for finance itself. Things like scenario analysis, sales forecasting, work and capital inventory management. And on the right hand side to uncover hidden shareholder value and growth opportunities, which is really back this one office front office business element, which can include you know, supporting M&A, supporting product development, product profitability, creative analytics, predictive modeling, all of those. So if you think of those four areas of the new digital technologies, finance is absolutely or should be in all of these, including on the right hand side, to the extent that you, and if you're not, you need to start moving yourself in there. The first two are absolutely clear, automation, robotics and processes that gathering data and reporting, they, they're enabling traditional functions. The right two are more around this sort of advancing business decision support business partnering one office concept that we talked about earlier on hopefully that uh, is clear but i thought it was a good depiction of what we've been talking about okay so how does your digital workforce and this is part of the lead into the last section that Chaz is going to talk about what is a digital workforce it's not just about robotic software it's not about ai on its own it's about the interface and interaction between digital and human activity which can, uh, and we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit in a minute. Some of the technology we already talked about on the right. What are some of the challenges? Well, it, you really need to understand the nature and use of what is a digital workforce, which is a combination of human and automated and intelligent activity. You need to train humans as well as training bots. Bots need to be trained, for example, to understand and leverage automation. And you need to move transition from a digitally enabled enterprise you need to transition to being becoming a digitally enabled enterprise based on this hybrid workforce and and Chaz will talk a little bit about that as well later in terms of current status um there's a lot of talk about this and there's a lot going on there's a lot of investigation i would say some of the the rpa basic technologies have really advanced from very fast over the last four or five years especially in the private sector starting to in the public sector in higher education but some catching up to do there for sure um, there is a definitely a, a desire to access and use data. Um, ERP, I was asked recently, is ERP irrelevant now? No, it's not irrelevant, but it was always overstated about how relevant it was, right? Because so many of processes around ERP were never on ERP in the first place. They were still manual and unintegrated. But ERP as a base foundation for capturing and analyzing the data is still critical. It's about what you do with that information, how you feed information into and out of that system, how you leverage the scale and the training around ERP. And these additional technologies help with some of that. Um, adoption of RPA, as I mentioned, is quite dramatic, but scaling is gonna be critical. And, and finance leaders are anxious not to miss this next generation, not just about being anxious, they can't miss this next generation because finance will lose its relevance if it isn't at the forefront of that. Now, whether that means it should be leading uh, a digital COE or not, Depends, right? I mean, you want to be involved in the conversation. Should that be IT? Should that be, IT? Should that be GBS? Should that be enterprise wide? Should that be finance? Depends. But if but you can definitely, as a finance organisation, be part of and pushing that conversation. And if you're pushing the conversation, you're more likely to be able to lead it as well. I would say. So, Phil, could you comment a little bit about maybe some of the uh, people challenges around creating that hybrid workforce and some of the pushback? Uh, you know, for example, people worried that it's a strategy to reduce headcount. So why should I participate? Well, it's two, there's two parts to that question. There's well, more than two parts to that question, but a couple of things. Firstly, uh, organizations don't really understand necessarily, or some organizations haven't retooled their own sort of HR internal people training development skill sets to understand what's coming. I could also apply that to the education system, quite frankly. That needs to adapt to build on, have training and certification and uh, and 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 training programs and courses around that. So that's the first thing and you need to develop. The second thing about um, this, the, the fear around having their jobs digitalized away. Well, that's been a, for all those other industrial, those other revolutions that's been there. 
So it is, a, it is about enabling people. It is about productivity. It is about scaling. It's about reskilling. It's about adding value. It's about people development. It's all of those. And those are some of the things you should be saying. But could, could RPA, for example, be part of a, a cost-cutting initiative in the current recession? Yes. But that's no different to any automation or be outsourcing or shared services initiative in the past. It's really about enabling the function to make it more efficient and effective and add value. I don't know if you wanted to add anything yourself, Chaz, to that comment. No, no, that's exactly right. And that's the, you know, you don't, it also can help the organization survive too. So it, it's a powerful strategy and you need to have a, a proper change management communication strategy to uh, drive the initiative forward. Yeah, it's, it's all about, again, I've, I mentioned this a little bit earlier on, when you talk about any change, any transformation, you need to talk about what's in it for me at the employee staff level too, uh, it's mm -hmm. critically. And, and then of course you need to understand your, your local, uh, you know, collective bargaining agreements, union agreements, et cetera as well. You can't just do this in isolation of your enterprise wide requirements. And in fact, you have to. So just, just talking about briefly, I'm going to touch on this because I know we're starting to run out of time. Um, some of the key trans transformation concepts, I mentioned R R RPA, but so you can take this away. I think you, you're going to be able to access these slides, but desktop automation tends to be uh, what we call, um, well, it's usually, as, as it said, it's usually attended next to each other. So it's literally enabling an individual to work on a desktop uh, with automation RPA tools. RPA tends to be more end-to-end server-based, tends to, to be more about presentation layer and interfacing with different systems and people and processes. Digitalized RPA is actually part of the trend around mobile and some of the better uh, rec uh, access tools and, and, and ability to use latest uh, intelligent automation like IVR and speech recognition. So those all relate to RPA. And then you get into machine learning which actually, to some degree, is a combination of RPA, but with analytics and decision engines attached with some element of judgment. And then AI, artificial intelligence, is a combination of robotics with analytics and artificial intelligence as opposed to just decision engines. And cognitive robots using machine learning or statistical modeling can continuously optimize decision making and action. Again, that was just to give you guys some, uh, something to take away afterwards about some definitions, but of course there are different definitions around. We happen to take this one from an SSO and report. Okay. Okay, great. Any uh, questions on digital strategies or say global trends uh, before we head into how to build your team? Hi, it's Mo here. I have one question. Go ahead. It's more from Camgemini. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, I've been following the conversation and you, were, you both were mentioning around the, uh, the role that um, any GBS in a shared service center should uh, evolve with. And uh, my curiosity came up when you were mentioning that uh, part of the, uh, the change and the evolution should, in, should be, for instance, including metrics and um, uh, key performance indicators that go beyond transaction. Yes. That, that you also mentioned that they should be agreed with the business. Um, I mean, in doing this together, which means, makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, so the question that I have is, in your perspective, who should be the level that uh, should be driving this conversation? Is it any CXO level? Any, is it really the shared services center, GBS help? at the, um, at the um, corporate level, which should be uh, the best in your perspective? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, I think um, different levels will contribute. I mean, part of it is depends on how your shared services slash GBS is organized, right? So if it's, if, it's a, if it's not GBS, if it's functional, it's gonna have to go up the functional chain. So it'll go through, you know, traditional VP finance control, the CFO route, and they should be having those conversations, but they should be enabled by the team within shared services. But to, I think your question is more around a real proper GBS model. I think the leader of the GBS in that decision should be directly interfacing with the C-suite. I think that's what your question is about. But of course, that, that, that will be enabled by the team within it. And we're gonna talk a little bit about enabling functions within GBS and shared services in the next section, which will cover some of that. But for GBS, I think you, you're gonna get more of a direct access to the C-suite. If a more functional shared services organization, you're probably gonna have to go up and across a little bit to have those functions with the C-suite. But regardless, every level should be engaging back to some of the questions earlier on with their partner in the business to determine what those measures and metrics should be. 
All right, thanks, thanks. Thank you so much. Right, Chaz. Hey, building your team. So first off, what's finance as a service mean? Phil did talk about that. It's really moving from that transactional approach, uh, functional approach that focuses on transactional activity, becoming that value added uh, partner to the business. Uh, you're going to becoming capable, agile, adaptable, efficient, proactive, uh, and, and drop, uh, taking these leading practices, uh, designing these processes end to end across silos, very important. Um, embracing digital strategies and a client focused approach that includes performance measurement, account management, and continuous improvement. And all of these strategies improve scalability and enable business resilience. We're seeing with several of our clients and other companies in the organization how much they've moved towards finance as a service, how much they've adopted these leading practices, really uh, did correspond with how well they were able to respond and be agile in responding to the pandemic. And that was an interesting uh, case study and it's gonna be a lot of case studies coming out of this because this is one of those rare instances where many different or all businesses are responding to the same instance. And so you can actually see comparisons across industries, uh, who's gonna be stronger and who uh, may not survive through this process. So this is an example of a potential operating model. Uh, it's really important to get the basics right. So this comes back to that first slide that we showed about the role of finance. And we see about organizing uh, into specialist team, being very intentional uh, when we do our process design and where we have the handoff and what those roles are, truly what their activities are as opposed to what a job description is. Um, at the bottom of the diagram, we highlight the client interaction framework, how that's foundational for the operating model. You know, for example, account management, that's how the provider is reaching out proactively, how the function reaches out proactively to the internal client through regular and ad hoc interaction, um, acting as that voice of the client and uh, really being clear about service expectation. You know, client contact management, that's how regular and daily interactions and uh, queries are coming into that. Is it a uh, best effort ad hoc approach or do you have a tiered approach? Is it very intentional in design? Service partnership agreements and, and all of these uh, work together uh, to support just, that. Just to, just to link back to the GBS discussion we had a little bit earlier, um, this is the role of finance operating model. It's not a reporting line necessarily um, view, okay? It's so, for example, linking back to the discussion we just had, you can have the, the shared services element up into GBS, and you can have the COEs, communities or centers of expertise functionally aligned, or you can even have some of the professional and technical be within GBS if the GBS has more up the value chain. What's never, what's never lo lo lost on finance is its overall responsibilities though, around what you see at the top and controllership and service delivery and policy and compliance and reporting. And that's never given up by finance, but how that delivery happens at the process level can change, can change around this. This is the whole operating model. It's not necessarily an, a, a reporting line picture. So at a most basic level, you can think of a process of the internal client providing those input to processes and those service requests, and then receiving the output and deliverables of the process. So let's think about the value add of enabling services and enabling functions. So there's some examples here of what those enabling functions are, the global process owners, the client interaction framework team, that dedicated capacity to do things like performance measurement, account management, uh, change management, communications, uh, the continuous improvement to actually have that professionals and project management to actually provide a capacity to leverage and do that in a formal approach. Um, then having the technology and then training. So, you're getting from production engagement uh, with both the provider and the internal client, client understanding change request, uh, and then also acting as a point of escalation. And then also enabling functions are providing input and output uh, key performance indicators to the client, as well as the provider will get those plus operational KPIs. And then you have a dedicated capacity producing those performance reports from a single source of truth. And then that continuous improvement and training resources. Uh, training can be a blind spot or not having the investment that we need. We need to do better than have someone just shadow uh, someone who's senior and having a dedicated uh, training 
capacity and having a professional trainer on board really helped drive the organization forward. Uh, so building your team. Four basic components to building your team. Uh, it's critical to assess your workforce, you know, matching the skills to role, understanding those gaps, addressing those gaps. Uh, organizations in many cases aren't ready for the technology revolution. Uh, not only are you going to leave your people potentially behind as you do start to adapt it, you may not be able to adapt those digital uh, strategies if you don't have those competencies uh, in play. Um, establishing the enabling functions we've talked about uh, on the prior slide. Um, enabling a digital team. You know, a question that we sometimes get is who owns the digital strategy? Who owns the resources? And that depends on the maturity of the organization, how big an investment they're making. Uh, it may be that it's an initial pilot and maybe it's in the operations and they're doing it for a very specific process to prove the concept, to prove the return on investment. But then over time, as you have several of these teams realize there's an opportunity potentially to create a central of expertise for data and for digital strategy that will have the critical mass to develop competencies and then you can leverage that across your organization. And then importantly, it's important to stay current because leading practices are always changing. So if you're leading today, that doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna stay leading tomorrow. Uh, things are moving. Phil, anything else you wanted to add to uh, building your team? Yeah, we've talked a lot about this, uh, Chaz, already, and I know we're sort of running out of time, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So barriers. So what are some barriers to finance transformation? Uh, lack of leadership, sponsorship, that's common uh, for any transformation and especially digital. Um, outdated legacy systems, uh, they've always been there, uh, but interestingly enough, the digital strategies can help uh, finish that last mile uh, where you have systems not talking to themselves, their strategies such as robotic process automation that can finally close those gaps and actually address some of those uh, legacy system issues. Manual methy procedure, not unexpected, and that's something that's gonna be addressed with that digital strategy. Very important to understand what you're automating, document, standardize, and decide what part can be uh, digital. Uh, the skill sets we talked about, that's very important, and not that people impact. The risk aversion, uh, the investment appetite, uh, can be lack of enthusiasm. We talked a little bit about that with change management and having a clear strategy, what is in it uh, for me, you need to address that and think about it from the perspective of your people. And then uh, managing the pandemic response in the upcoming uh, or existing economic recession. That, that's an interesting one. It, it's double-sided. On, on one hand, it can suck up capacity and the resources to enable a transformation. But on the other hand, uh, many organizations are actually using the pandemic to break through those barriers and that resistance because it just has to get done. And organizations are finding they can do a lot more on that burning platform to enable change. The only, thing, the only thing I would add on this slide is a lot of these you'll have seen on any transformation slide for decades, right? Our daily legacy systems, manual message processes, risk aversion, lack of leadership sponsorship, absolute investment. You, what you've got to do in the new world of future finance, you've got to layer on top of here significant new digital technology enablement, significant macroeconomic changes, the need to move fast and the need to reskill, retool and re-emphasize re, re the roles and responsibility within your finance team. You can't move slow. You can't be old school. You can't be traditional. You have to, you still have to do some of those traditional things, but you need to have a different view of the finance function. We talked a lot about this business partnering, the agile, the data driven, the business partnering, all of these things that we've talked about, the speed of which finance needs to adapt is significant. So you have to sort of get through some of these, uh, these, these, these barriers like risk aversion as quickly. Massive, manual messy processes, they will always be there, but there are ways, as Chaz mentioned, of getting around that with, uh, with robotic automation, including legacy system. So many of these have always been there, but it's the people technology side of things that have, have really been layered on over the last, uh, last, last few years. Great, thank you, Phil. So here we talked about the four critical success factors. Many initiatives start with technology. You cannot do technology alone. It's not a silver bullet. You need to think about upstream and downstream processes. You need to address your competencies and understand your people to support the change. Client can be a blind spot. So we've, uh, from JT Partners, we have a formal approach of looking at client engagement and you have some of the elements there listed to really engage your client as we talked about.
And that's internal and external client to be, to be clear. You know, we talk about one office is about the external client, but to enable the external client service, you need to enable your internal client relationships, break down silos, everything we talked about earlier. Great. So timing of organizational versus system changes. So today you need to get some system changes and organizational change to get to that future state. There's route to it. You can go directly. Um, organizational system change at the same time. You can do the system first and then plan to do the organizational change or do the organizational change and then the system. Uh, when we work with our client, it tends to be a hybrid between route A and route C, where you identify what technology can be implemented to achieve the future state and that go live, and then what your future roadmap is. Do not recommend route B. That's more leaning towards technology being that silver bullet. Yeah, so, so just quickly, I know we run out of time, but you know, we, have about, we do have about two more minutes. So yeah. okay. um, I don't know if you want to cut to a question. Yeah, okay. So just to emphasize, Route B only ever applies in limited circumstances, in our opinion, but we're happy to talk about that some more. So it's really AAC or a hybrid of thereof, we tend to recommend more. Okay. Great. Uh, last comment here, five phase approach to transformation. And uh, we'd be happy to talk about that. And I think at this point we have some downloads and then our Q&A. So why don't we just open up for um, any final question. And if we don't have time to address it, we'd be happy to do some follow up to make sure. Absolutely. That. Yeah, yeah. So thank you, Phil and Chaz, for that amazing workshop. That was so much content. That was great. Um, we do have time for one question. So does anyone um, have a question? Please don't be shy. I won't make you put your camera on. <laughs> no more worries. questions, but thank you. Anyone very have much. a question? No worries. If you, if you, if you, is that a question? Sorry. Yeah, I did get, I did get one question. So, um, someone was just wondering if you could share examples of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence in finance today. Could you share a quick example? Yeah, we sort of touched on that a little bit earlier on with uh, that slide that talked about the McKinsey slide. Um, but the machine learning is where you are sort of leveraging uh, a, a, basically an FP&A, financial planning analysis and reporting. You get a lot of that. So yeah, thank you, thank you, Chaz. So it's around it's around leveraging the the information and and putting uh, decision trees and decision engines within it to learn from decisions, provide better analysis and outcomes. So FP&A and R financial planning and net reporting, and then into analysis, absolutely machines learning. From, a, from, a, from an intelligent automation perspective, it, again, to, to early to that slide, you can build off that to, be, to add value around point in time decisions, for example, pricing. So you feed the information in, you'll provide a machine learning type of tool on it, and then you do some learning around decisions, what, what produces the best outcome from a new product, from a new price, from a new region, and that's where you can use IA. So you have, so it goes up the scale. You have the basic robotic process engine, you have machine learning, and then you have IA on top of it, which links to our, quite frankly, our end-to-end -end finance uh, d delivery mechanism. So very quickly. Ma amazing. So I just want to kick it over to Kent really fast. Um, Kent, if you can show the amazing, amazing sketch you have put together. Absolutely. Let me get that pulled up here for you. Okay. And then we do have to jump to the next session, um, which is going to be starting in 15 minutes. And that's going to be unleashing your human potential, constructing an AI pi uh, pipeline your organization can get behind. And that's going to be um, led by Agilify. So that'll be happening in just 15 minutes. But I do want Ken to show this great um, sketch that he put together. Yes, I'm sorry. Here, just one more. second. Sure. <laughs> We're getting fussy. Here we go. <laughs> okay. There we are so far. Amazing. So um, if you could, that looks great. So if, you, if everyone would like to get this, which I'm sure you will, I personally want a copy of it, um, please stop by Chasey's booth. Um, it will be available in 24 hours uh, once Ken puts his final touches on it. Um, and please feel free to um, utilize the platform, win prizes, utilize our gamification. Um, really, there's so many amazing things you can do within this platform. And um, it, don't forget to visit uh, Chasey's booth. They'll be there for you. They're giving away prizes, um, you know, in conjunction with us participating in the demo drive. Um, so we will see you there.